Uh, good evening, it's March 29th, 2020, and I'm sharing our Sunday evening Bible study this evening uh, from home. Um, to start with, out, let me uh, share with you a story about a little bit of the history of one of our favorite songs in our hymnal. Many Christians are familiar with the song that we call The Solid Rock. And the song uh, was written by a man named Edward Moat. He was born in 1797. And at the age of 15, he heard the preaching of a pastor named John Hyatt at Tottenham Court Road Chapel in London. At that point, he put his trust in Jesus Christ as his Savior. Edward Moat wrote over 100 songs and became a Baptist preacher in England. He wrote this song over a week's time in 1834, and originally had six verses instead of the four that we're very familiar with. Additionally, its original title was Jesus, My All in All. And tonight we're going to start with a, singing the first verse of that song. Uh, for most of you, you don't have a hymnal, but the words of that first verse go like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So tonight I'm going to start this off with a song that we sing together. Do one verse of that song, and I think we can do it together. If you know that song, you can join me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Well, let's remember that Christ is our solid rock in uncertain times. He's our anchor in the storms of life. As we start out tonight, let me share with you two prayer requests or prayer needs for our congregation. We support uh, several missionaries, and tonight I just want to share with you two missionary uh, needs that are that are uh, you may not be aware of, and uh, since these uh, are concerning of people who are overseas, I wanted to share that with you. One of those missionaries is with uh, couples is Larry and Roseanne Thornburg. They are in Madrid, Spain, and they wrote us recently, and they told in that letter that they have also been restricted for meetings in um, in Spain. Or, uh, church meetings, and they have not been able to meet their restrictions at the time of the letter, which I received about two weeks ago, was until the end of March. I'm not sure if that will be revised at the end of March or not, but they did have that. Additionally, I was, I was looking on their Facebook page, and uh, they just noted uh, that they had, uh, on their Facebook, that they would have been declared virus-free but they did step out and go to the store to buy some food one or two times. So they were said to not be virus free. Yeah. And they said, we're just going to have to trust God through this and do what God helps us to do in our walk or through that. <clears throat> All right. Other missionaries are missionaries appointed to Taiwan. They are not there yet. They are the Murrays. <clears throat> and I have a missionary letter. I'm going to read that tonight for you. And they said, We've packed up our bags and moved from California this month. Some of our moving boxes pictured on the side. The first move went smoothly. We are now in preparation for the next bigger move to Taiwan. However, God has put our travel plans on hold. Effective March 19th, Taiwan officials began refusing entry to all foreign visitors due to the corona outbreak. Sadly, this has forced us to postpone our original plans of departure. 
until an undetermined future day. We're forced to wait until Taiwan reopens their country uh, to foreigners. As we've all witnessed the events of COVID-19 rapidly unfold and try to respond to all the numerous changes, I'm reminded of the powerful grace of God through difficulty. We can read from 2 Corinthians 8 that this amazing grace of God was evident in the lives of the suffering Macedonians. Paul says it's because of the boundless grace of God that the Macedonians were overflowing with joy, joy and earnestly seeking for any chance to serve the Lord, even in the midst of famine, suffering, loss, and tremendous hardship. Even though Taiwan is close to us now, right now we are finding God's grace to be sufficient. Our hope is unwavering because our God is unchanging. To go to Taiwan in our own strength or according to our own wisdom is folly. According to Deuteronomy 1, 42 to 43, we want to go in God's timing, perfect timing with his hand, fighting our spiritual battles before us. Nevertheless, we're eager and most willing to return to Taiwan and begin our work of the gospel and start language training as soon as the Taiwanese government allows. So those are our missionaries, and we want to pray for them, both the Thornburgs and the missionaries point us to Taiwan, the Murrays. And uh, we're glad to have uh, them on our group of missionaries that we support. What a wonderful group of people that we have were privileged to support as missionaries. <clears throat> well, let me pray for them tonight, and then we will start our Bible study. <clears throat> Dearly Father, we pray for both the Murrays and the Thornburgs. We thank you for their ministry as uh, missionaries and uh, their desire to share the gospel with people across the world in various countries. Lord, you have a plan for them. You're working in their lives. You're working in those areas where they plan to go to and where they're at. Be with the Thornburgs in Spain. Bless them with the ministry they have in Madrid. And we pray for the Murrays in Taiwan as they plan to go there. Bless them with that ministry. Thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which changes lives, families, cultures, societies, and our world as we yield to you. We ask God tonight that you would guide us in our Bible study as we look at Psalm 146. You would help us to understand this passage of Scripture a little bit better. Apply it to our life. May you be honored and glorified, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please turn with me to Psalm 146. Psalm 146, we'll be working on our third installment for that psalm. Psalm 146, I'll be uh, reading verses 1 to 10. Really focusing tonight on the outline of this. And just breaking that down with some, just some insights along the way as we walk through this. All right, Psalm 146, starting in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. He returns to this earth. In that very day his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. So that's Psalm 146, 1 through 10. Uh, major focus of this psalm is this. 
God's trustworthiness. God is trustworthy. This is the major focus of this psalm. God is trustworthy. I can trust him. Yeah. And the title of this, um, several just messages on this is just blessings come from trusting God. If you want to be a blessing in your life, you better trust God. Okay? Trust. And the like this old song goes, trust and obey. Well, the unnamed author of Psalm 146 emphasizes the Lord's trustworthiness. We shouldn't trust put our trust in other people, he warns, for they can do little to help us. God, on the other hand, is all-powerful and completely faithful. When no other person can help us, God, the creator of earth and heaven, heaven and earth, can. Furthermore, he cares deeply about those who are in need. Introduction to this is in verse 1 to 2, and this is the introduction, it has an introduction, has a conclusion, Verse 1 to 2, again, that reads, Praise the Lord. Uh, praise the Lord, O my soul, while I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Here we have, in the introduction, uh, number 1, introduction, verses 1 and 2. Uh, letter A is this. And this, under the introduction, there's two parts. Letter A is praise the Lord. And so this is a command given, praise the Lord, verse 1. Okay, uh, The second part of that is in verse 2. But here are verse 1, praise the Lord. And we have here two ideas given about praising God right here in verse 1. So the first one is the question, who? Who should praise him? And the answer is all people are to praise God. This is a command given to everyone. Uh, Psalms 146 to 150 all begin and end with the same words, praise you the Lord. Our lives would do well to, to, <laughs> if we did the same, to praise the Lord. And this is a command, although it's given in the context of Israel, it's a universal command for all people. All people are to praise God. Okay, So this is a universal <clears throat> command, all people are to praise the Lord. Second part, when? question is, when are we to praise the Lord? We are to praise the Lord in spite of our difficulties. Okay, Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. When all is said and done, the hearts of people who truly are God's people need to praise Him all of our lives. <clears throat> we understand enough about the nature of God to praise Him in spite of our difficulties. B, I will praise the Lord as long as I live. Verse 2. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. So here, two ideas about praising God. First part of that is, says, while I live, I'll praise the Lord. And I then I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. So the first question is, how much should I praise him? And the answer is simple. I praise him with my whole life. Top to bottom, everything. Okay, <clears throat> We praise him with our whole life. I am not just to praise God with just portions of my life. Not just with my job, or just with my family, or just with my church friends, or Christian friends, or my neighbors. I am to praise him God at all times. Okay. So this is with my whole life. And the next question is how long? And so in verse 2 it tells us how long I'm to praise him. And it says, I praise him, praise, sing praises to my God while I have my being. As long as I live, I will praise God. And so here is two ideas. How much my whole life, how long, all the days of my life. All right. Now, option number one for help in life. This is point two on an outline, if you have an outline. Uh, point two, option one for help in life is people. Okay. In verses three and four, it says, don't put your trust in princes, 
nor in a son of man in whom there's no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Here, we have two ideas. Again, we have a warning given in this. And then, secondly, we have a reason. So first, option number one for help in life. People. People around us, okay? Now, the warning is this. Don't trust mankind or humanity or people around you for ultimate help in life. That's right. Don't trust humanity for your ultimate help in life. If you expect any portion of humanity, whether it's a spouse or a friend or a family member or a politician or a government, <clears throat> to give you 100% perfection of help, you'll be disappointed. None of them can do it. Okay, none of them have the ability to help you perfectly. Okay, and it tells us why. But we're not to trust mankind for ultimate help. It says don't put your trust in princes, which is really influential leaders. Okay, nor in a son of man. That means just humans, okay, where there's no help. So who do you trust? Uh, a professor named Donald Williams and pastor wrote this in uh, one of the uh, commentaries on Psalms. He writes this, we are faced with only two alternatives in life, either to trust men, including ourselves, or to trust God. Most people, when they are really honest, admit that they spend most of their time trusting men. I'm just reading what it says. They trust politicians to run the country. They trust news commentators to tell them what's going on in the world. They trust <laughs> professors to educate them. They trust doctors to diagnose them. And they trust pastors and priests to care for their souls. Here is where we make our investments. We put our faith, time, money, and energy into what people say. Most of us would admit that we do not really pray over decisions. We do not expect God to run our lives day to day. Nevertheless, the psalmist clearly tells us that we are foolish to continue this. As you look to men, even great spiritual leaders, we need to ask one question. Can this person save me? And that question places every human being into the right perspective. And the answer is no. Not a single person can save you from all the issues of life. So the psalmist here writes under inspiration of God, don't put your trust in princes nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. Okay. Now, the reason is also given in verse 4. So not just don't do this, but there's a reason. So in verse 4 it says, His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, and that very day his plans perish. So, the reason is people will pass away. That's letter B on an outline. B, the reason people will pass away. And there's two parts under this for people passing away. There are this. Uh, first off, our spirit or our breath will come to an end sometime. Our spirit or our breath will come to an end sometime. It says there in verse 4, his spirit departs, he returns to his earth. So that word spirit also is translated as breath in some translations. And it reminds us, it's that Hebrew word ruach, and uh, found in several places of scripture. It really points to that idea of, of the breath of a person that you, uh, you have. In uh, Genesis 6, 17, it says, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. It's that word, the breath of life. Or from under heaven and everything that's the earth shall die. That was the great flood, global flood. Genesis 17, 7, 15 says, They went in unto Noah, into the ark, to and to of all flesh, wherein is the breath. It's that word, that spirit, the breath of life. Genesis 7, 22, 
all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. So here we have that idea of the breath of life, the spirit of life. One day, our breath will depart. We'll no longer breathe. Our spirit will depart. Uh, but breath is really the idea, the breath of life. And we will return to the earth. Uh, just one or two passages here that talk about the returning to the earth. Genesis 3, 9, 19, 3, 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. You are going to return to the earth. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So first off, we don't trust in mankind because all of us are going to die one of these days. And then secondly, our plans will no longer be considered. Here in verse 4, that last part says, The very day his plans perish. In that very day, his plans perish. Okay. So this shows us that we are mortal. We have limitations with our plans of life. And that idea for plans is really a sense of your thinking, whether good or bad, will perish with you in the day that you um, that you pass away. So interesting things there in terms of uh, <clears throat> the day that you die, your plans perish, your breath ends. Therefore, we don't put our trust in people, full trust, because ultimately only God is worthy of our trust. All right, second option for help in this chapter is in verses 5 through 9, and that help is found in God. And, and so we see this, the key to the chapter really is in verse 5. If you look at this chapter, this is the central core key of the chapter. Verse 5 says, Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord is God. And it goes on. This is number 3 on an outline. Option two for help in life is God. Okay, This is the key. Blessing comes, here's the key, blessing comes from trusting in God. For your help and your hope. That's where the blessing comes. Our blessing comes from trusting in God for your hope and for your help. There's two parts here. He's our present help. That's what talk, help is, the present tense. And then hope is future tense. I can trust God for the future. I can trust him for the help now. And I have hope for the future. So present and future, we find hope. A number of years, I wrote a short little song. I'm not going to sing it, but I'm just going to read it to you. It's called, We Will Trust in God. It says, some trust in fast cars, some trust in strong arms. We put our trust in the name of our God. Some trust in money, some trust in beauty. We will trust in God. He's our refuge, our rock, our sure defense in the raging storms of life. He's unchanging, secure, and never failing through the battle strife. Some trust in mankind, some trust in fine wine. We put our trust in the name of our God. Some trust in nations, princes, and programs. We will trust in God. He's our refuge, our rock, our sure defense in the raging storms of life. He is unchanging, secure, and never failing through the battle strife. So we trust in God. He is our help and our hope. Now, why should we trust God? The Bible here gives us five reasons to trust God. Five reasons. Number one, he is the creator of everything. Verse 6. He made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them. goes on, who keeps truth forever. So he made heaven and earth. Okay. Uh, in these verses, we are taught to trust our creator. Uh, as I had mentioned previously, uh, currently there are some politicians that when they get to the Declaration of Independence, where it says that all men are created equal, 
uh, <clears throat> with inalienable rights given to them by their creator. When they get to that point, their creator, they balk, they stop, they, they, they say, well, that thing, that, you know, you know what it is. And they try not to say the bad word, and the bad word is creator. They don't ever they don't want to say God. Uh, interestingly, well, the Bible tells us there's a creator God. Creator God, who created the universe, just like the Bible said, in six days, by his spoken word, by his hand, fashioning creation, as it tells us, in a way that an, only an omnipotent and omniscient God could do. And when was that? 20 billion years ago, maybe? Well, not according to the Bible. God, the Creator, indicates that was approximately 6,000 years ago. God, as the Creator, is taught from Genesis 1 throughout the Bible. First time in Genesis 1, it, 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The last time it was used is in Revelation 14, verse 7. The last time creator, God as creator is mentioned, but it, you can see it all the way from the beginning to the end of the book. And in Je Revelation 14, verse 7, it says, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. God is the creator from Genesis to Revelation. It doesn't stop like it. Like we're not sure whether it's right or wrong. All the way throughout the book, he's the creator God. Revelation 14, 7. I probably have uh, 50 books in my library on scientific reasons that I can believe in God as creator. And uh, the list just gets longer and longer the longer I live. Those discoveries become more and more amazing. From the amazing, incredible design of the human eye, to the human ear, to our amazing bodies, to this earth that we live in, which is very special in the universe, and even to the tiniest storehouse and factory of the cell and DNA, it's amazing what happens when we begin to look at it. Okay, I want to tell you what, the more you look at it, you realize this wasn't put together by chance and mutation over billions of years of time. It's going to need a lot more than billions of years <clears throat> to, to get something from nothing. It's going to take more than billions of years. There are probably quadrillions and quintillions and all the rest up. You can't, zero times anything, can't get anything more than zero. <clears throat> all right. In fact, I have a couple of videos behind me. A couple of those things that I, I picked up through the years. The Wonders of God's Creation. Six video series, Wonders of God's Creation, the Milky Way, Solar System, Planet Earth, Thundering Earth, Roaring Waters, Whirling Winds, Animal Kingdom, Human Life. This one is a fearfully and wonderfully made about the baby in the womb and the amazing things about the baby as it's created. Then this one, which is actually in English, but it has Chinese subtitles, Unlocking the Mystery of Life about DNA. Incredible things, amazing things. Couldn't happen by mutation and random chance and billions of years. And this one is, again, with, I, I've got the Chinese subtitle one, The Privileged Planet, uh, put out by Guillermo. And uh, that's the, the, the author. And a fantastic video on why Earth is so unique in the universe. It couldn't be anything but God who did it. Amazing stuff. I've got lots and lots of these videos. Amazing thing. God is creator. He is not the one who made evolution happen, but he was creator. Amazing God we have. <clears throat> well, he is our creator. Secondly, I can trust him because he keeps truth forever. Verse 6, last part, keeps truth forever. Uh, he is faithful to keep truth. And the commitment of our God is unchangeable. He keeps truth forever. Next, number 3, he meets our needs. And verses 7, 8, and 9, we have a series of ways he meets our needs. 
you look at those, you go, wow, God meets our needs in so many ways. It says in verse 7, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. In this part, it mentions the word Lord, which is the, really the name Yahweh, used five times. And this focus evidently has an idea of the covenant God who we are in commitment, have a covenant with. So some wonderful things right there of the covenant God that we have, who we, uh, <clears throat> we are connected to. So he meets our needs. Next we see in verse 8, he loves the righteous. It says, the Lord loves the righteous. Okay, What a blessing. I can trust God because he loves those who are willing to obey him. And then it says, I can trust God because he will deal with the wicked. Verse 9, he, is, he will frustrate the plans of the wicked. It says the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. What does that mean? It means that he makes their way crooked. Okay, if I'm living godly life, he loves me, going to bless me. But if I'm living a wicked life, he's going to make my way crooked. Okay, he's going to turn it upside down. Okay, So five ways, five reasons to trust the Lord. First, he's my creator. Uh, secondly, he keeps truth forever. Thirdly, he meets my needs. All sorts of needs. Then fourthly, he loves the righteous. And fifthly, he frustrates the plans of the wicked. Well, the conclusion is found in verse 10 here. To this psalm, verse 10, The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. So, verse 10 has three parts of it that we want to focus on. And the first is a declaration of God's faithfulness. A declaration of God's faithfulness. It says that the Lord is faithful to all generations, he keeps his covenant, he has wonderful promises for his people, and he is Israel's God. He declares, I'm faithful who I am. Secondly, he declares his sovereignty, declaration of God's sovereignty. Indicates the Lord reigns forever throughout all generations. And although the wicked rise up against God's people, God will always prevail. The Lord is always on the throne, and the creator of heaven and earth will reign throughout eternity. He is sovereign. And uh, then finally, there's the final command in verse uh, 10, praise the Lord. So conclusion is God says, I'm faithful. God indicates he's also he's sovereign. He is ruling, he's watching over, he's sovereign over the things of life. And then lastly, just would you just praise God? That's what we need to do. Well, those are some ideas tonight to look at Psalm 146. Uh, let me just read a closing comment about this uh, chapter I have in one of my commentaries. It says the most practical application from this chapter on God's faithfulness to the, is to the righteous who he loves. The righteous, therefore, should demonstrate their love for him by emulating his faithfulness to the covenant, championing, championing, championing justice, feeding the hungry, bringing relief to those in bondage, and taking care of the stranger, the widow, and orphan. It remains true in the New Testament that God most often meets those needs to the ministry of his servants. So just a couple application points tonight. How am I involved in serving others? I'm not involved in serving others. I'm a sideline person. I need to rethink. What does God want me to do? <clears throat> I need to serve others. Two, do I know God as my king? 
Or is he just a concept? Or is he just a distant being in outer space? Or is he my personal friend, my God, and my King? Now, you need to ask that question. Who is he? Thirdly, how can I know Jesus is my God and King? Good question. Let me start out with just some facts about how you can know Jesus as your God and King. And you just go with L-I-F-E. First, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then God loves you. I, isolated. We are isolated from him because of our sins. Romans 3, 23, 3, <clears throat> For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Romans 6, 23. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then we need forgiveness. That's F for our sins. And Jesus died to take away the sin panel that we have. We've all sinned and we need Jesus' forgiveness. And then E, he offers us the gift of eternal life when we trust in him as our Savior. I encourage you to come to Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let me pray, and we'll have a short closing song and end our time tonight together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this psalm. It helps remind us that we put our trust in you. Although we put our trust in others around us, institutions and people, the ultimate trust has to be in the perfect, omniscient, omnipotent God himself. None of us have that capability. Only you do. And I ask God that you would help us to be putting our trust in you day by day through the challenges of life, the joys of life, opportunities of life that are before us. We need you, and we need to trust you. Lord, if there's somebody here who's listening to this and they have no relationship with Jesus Christ, that today that they would come to realize their need and they would respond by asking you to be their Savior. With a sincerity of heart, we pray that they would respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to end with a, a final song, just a short verse of a song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, old hymn written back in 1922 by Helen Lemel, but the words go, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So if you know those words, you can sing along with me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Well, I'm glad to have each of you with us today, those who are watching this, my video. And we're praying that God will continue to use your lives. And remember, with God, nothing's impossible. Put your trust in God. Follow him through the challenges of life. God bless you.